Okay, first of all, John, talk to us about the origins and the purpose of the uh, Buffalo Black Media Coalition. Okay, starting with the origins, it's a spinoff from the Build organization that took place back in 1968. It came as a result of some actions we were taking against the Buffalo News and the Cory Express. The Cory Express in particular, what we did at that time as a result of my involvement with Bill, we looked at the employment record and who was the reporters at both of those two newspapers and we found that there was a very scarcity of African Americans and other minorities working for the paper. As a consequence, we we, we call for a demonstration around uh, uh, the Courier Express. And it has some success in that they began to seek out African Americans for reporting kinds of jobs. Uh, Henry Locke was one of the individuals who was graduated up into a reporter's position and went on to be very successful down the line. Now, from that, you know, I began to get a better picture of what was happening in terms of communication and how important it was to our community because many articles that came out in the paper and the way they were uh, 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 dealing with us in the news, uh, not newspaper, but television and radio, we were always on the negative side of things because they had no sensitivity to the issues and the concerns that we were trying to address at that time. So I began a little investigation, what could be done about blocking or changing some of their attitudes. And I learned at that time about the federal Communications Commission and the kinds of rules and regulations that they had imposed upon uh, telecommunications. And as a result, I started doing file reviews and found pretty much the same thing, that African Americans were very scarce in terms of their employment history. And that we never did write many letters or complain about things that was happening and was addressing us in our community. So as a result, we formulated the Buffalo Black Media Coalition. A uh, group out of Rochester got wind of what we were doing here and they were on the same kind of track and as a result they had done an investigation of WECK and w, uh, NSY, I think it was at that time. What were the issues concerning those radio stations? Though they, they, the, the, the reporting uh, of what was happening within the community, failure to hire and consider African Americans for job opportunities in terms of being disc jockeys and other news reporters. Those were the primary kinds of things. And just that they didn't have anybody that was sensitive on their staff to what was happening in our community. As a consequence, we always come up looking bad. And as a result, the coalition started then doing the file reviews. And at that time, this is around 1968-69, we filed a petition to deny the license of WECK and WSY something that was in Rochester. It was One station was in Rochester and two stations in Buffalo. We filed petitions to deny their license. And as a consequence of that, uh, the FCC upheld the, 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 the petition and called for a hearing around that. And the stations went silent for one year. And you know, this is motivating when we find that we can do something in regards to how the media was addressing the issues of African Americans in the community. And so we formulated the Black, Buffalo Black Media Coalition at that time. And it was primarily to look at what was going on in the industry, to do some things to change, to bring about change, to increase this employment opportunities for African Americans coming out of the community. And we used the regulations that was already on the books by the FCC. So that's pretty much how we got started. Okay, were there any other issues concerning any other radio stations that you could recall? All the stations, as I looked at the files, and you know, that's a, a tremendous job, because I think there were 17 or 18 stations in town at that time. And you know, as a novice going through doing a file review, reading letters and all kinds of other information, trying to understand the regulations, you know, we, we, we looked at every station and we found that every station in town was failing to carry African American stories in a positive light, as well as they did not have 
many African Americans or very few African Americans were working for any of the stations, except for the black owned station that was Buffalo at that time. Now, WBLK had some African Americans who were working for them, but they were under tight kinds of controls. They didn't do much reporting in regards to the issues and concerns that was affecting the community in a realistic kind of way. some of the other issues, if you can remember, concerning the uh, Courier Express newspaper? The Courier Express, you know, it was a family-owned newspaper. I can't call the lady's name who was heading that up and was, you know, primary owner of that. But it's the kind of issues that I had just mentioned in that there was a lack of sensitivity to issues and concerns of the black community. They had a very scarcity of African Americans working for them throughout the whole industry there, but the whole, you know, their newspaper. So those were some pretty much important matters for us because jobs were still, at that time, jobs was a very important thing. And we felt that if we're going to buy their paper, then they should be willing to hire us. Okay, and there were, and were, there, there, were re, there were resolutions that came out of dealing with the newspapers and the radio stations? Uh, yes, uh, I, have to, I, I was very pleased to see that they took some very serious initiatives to consider the issues of the black community and then they hired on a number of African Americans who to work at the papers, the Courier Express and the Buffalo News. Now, you know, it's not that they're that great, that is the Buffalo News right now, but it did show a great improvement over what the things were like at that point in time. Okay, let's move over to the uh, local television industry. Talk to us about, I mean, we're gonna go, I'll go through each of the different TV stations. Mm -hmm. Let's first start off, talk about some of the issues that concerned uh, Channel 17, the public broadcasting. Channel 17, which is a public owned station, as you are aware of, you know, they were having the same kind, or showing the same kind of difficulties in dealing with African Americans. One of the things that was going on is a lot of the shows that came on, they were not, you know, paying attention to our needs and they weren't being a, a public servant as you might say and providing information that was relevant to African Americans so that was one of the issues so we started looking at what kind of shows they were you know airing off the over the airwaves and over the television screen that you know sh and, and as a consequence we decided you needed to do something in increasing issues and shows that was relevant to African-American people, because we were a sizable portion of this population in this area. So that was one of the things. And the other one is also employment. Uh, we found that, you know, they were training individuals, a lot of internships, but African-Americans were not getting the internships. They weren't doing the recruiting, recruiting as, uh, in a strong way, and in a way that brought in African-Americans. So as a result of that, we filed some complaints with the station and we provided some information in terms of where they might turn to get dollars to assist African Americans to go on as interns and also into a training program, which they did apply for and got. It was called the Rockefeller uh, Training Program or Rockefeller Telecommunications something at that time. And we had, uh, I think it was three individuals that went in the first year and it's been going on ever since. And as a result of that, those individuals who went in early, the early ones, they went on and became very successful in the telecommunications area. Okay. How is about um, channel, our uh, main three stations, uh, channels two, four, and seven? What were some of the issues or were they the same? Okay, this is a different picture today. At that time, there was no African Americans owning any of the television stations within the Buffalo region in western New York. Today we have two stations that are minority owned by African Americans. That would be Channel 2 and Channel 7. Well at that time, you know, our concerns as I indicated was not of much importance. They said what they wanted, they did what they wanted, they treated us unfairly in many cases in regards to issues and stories that was coming to cost. Crime was a big issue for them. Anytime a crime occurred and, it was, uh, and, and, and the person was African American, oh, you better know they told that very loudly. And they slanted in such a way as that our community was 
a criminal type of community. So those are some of the issues that we dealt with at that time. I recall where they used to come on the air and they would call uh, the hoodlums, okay, or the east side, or some kind of name they should designate it that would allow people to say, oh, that's coming out of the black community. Yeah, They're pistol, the ones. Pistol pack and punks. Yeah, pistol pack and punks is one of the things. So we did some things in regards to them stopping that kind of language coming across the air. And uh, they, they, we wrote up a program. We wrote up a program, and they wrote up a protocol for their reporters at that time. And I'd like to add, they did the same thing at the Buffalo News. They wrote up a protocol in terms of terms that they should stay away from in terms that they should use in regards to uh, news reporting in terms of African Americans in the, the black community. Early on, let's, let's just stay, staying within the TV realm, uh, early on in the, um, in the early years of Buffalo Black Media Coalition, Buffalo, New York also saw the development of cable television, which was through, uh, I believe, either Cable Scope or Courier Cable. I don't re quite remember which right. it was known back then. Well, explain what the uh, BBMC's role was in the development of cable television. Yeah. Okay, Courier uh, uh, Express, they owned the cable franchise at, early on, and then Cable Scope came into to being. Doing that, that, that's when it was just budding. It was just coming into existence at that time. And the Black Media Coalition affiliated itself with the National Black Media Coalition. And conferences and informal sessions that we were able to hold, host and be a part of gave us up on, you know, what was happening in the whole realm of telecommunication in this, term, in this sense, particularly cable. And there was rules that's being generated at that, at that time by the Federal Communications Commission to for cable. And we found out then that there was due to come online a public access station. So what we did, we searched out and pulled together all the information that we can get our hands on regarding how this public access station was supposed to operate, who was supposed to operate it. And lo and behold, we find out that a community-based organization was eligible to apply and operate a public access station. As a result, I had a connection at that time, or the Buffalo Black Media Coalition had a connection with Sunship Communications because they were a group that was very interested in communicating Okay, things. talk to us about Sunship Communications. Sunset Communication was a group of individuals local here who were very interested in breaking into the telecommunications realm. They had uh, they had desires to do production work, to do operate a station. They had they had the whole gamut of interests of doing some things. A bunch of young guys, very ambitious, very bright too. And what we were able to do is to work hand in hand in regards to doing some things within the industry. As a result of my meetings in Washington and in New York and Chicago and information I was picked up, I was able to provide them information regarding public access and how it was due to operate and that they would be eligible to apply to become the cable operators for the public access center. And so we started then putting together a proposal and we had that proposal reviewed by some experts to see whether or not that we were on the right track. And lo and behold, we were. At the time when the city of Buffalo was ready to announce its RFP for a uh, cable access operator, they had their proposal all together. There was a number of other groups who had applied for operating the cable access, but none of them were able to match the quality of the Sunship Communications application. Okay, what was the uh, process like in getting approval for the contract? Well, to do that, there was a cable access board, and uh, the, 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 the city of Buffalo appointed myself as a board member for the city in regard of the state cable access committee. I think it's one of the first times when a private citizen, not an elected official, was given the right to serve on a governmental committee with some rights to vote on issues and matters that was brought before that committee. That was the Cable Access Committee. And as a result, you know, I was able to assist Sunship and review the, 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 the proposals that come in. And without a doubt, there was a unanimous uh, a decision, a consensus by all the members that Sunship had the best uh, proposal to operate it. And they were awarded the contract. Did you want to lean back in the chair? 
Okay. Fix it. Fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, am I? Okay. Um, what is your opinion of the reason why Sunship folded eventually as a, a public access provider? There are a number of issues that come up around Sunship and its operation of the cable access uh, 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 line with the, uh, within the city of Buffalo. I would have to say one of the most important was finances. They were not provided what I would consider sufficient dollars to operate the cable access center at a level that everybody had anticipated it would be taking place. They, you know, we were wrestling with some things. We didn't know how much it would cost. They didn't really know how much it would cost until they got into it. Then they found out at that time that there was not sufficient dollars to be able to do the kinds of things that the community would like to see done and the politicians who were a part of this who would like to see done. So that was one of the issues. Then they did have some administrative kinds of problems. And uh, there were some other issues I don't think that was that important in terms of programming and things of that nature that came into play that had its impact on Sonship and the way they were operating. And they were a uh, militant kind of group of people and they wanted to do things their way and they weren't that ready to compromise, which was something that got in the way because they rubbed some people the wrong way as a result. And as the result of that, they got negative kind of vibes or negative kind of perceptions of them as an operator. So uh, the monies was one of the things, and as a result of the money uh, and some issues and problems that they were encountering around that, uh, it was a decision to make to find a new operator. And Sunship then was uh, released from its obligation to operate the, uh, the public access center. Okay, after Sunship, there were like a number of different providers of public access throughout the years, like BKM, BCTV, Buffalo Neighborhood Network, and now the city of Buffalo. What is your view on how public access has been run throughout those years up until today? There's still improvements that can be made. All those others who did have a hand in doing some public access or public service operating encountered the same kinds of problems. Primarily, they had not sufficient dollars to do the job at a high quality level, which they all aspired to. So that was the primary issue. Uh, right now, this, under the city's bailiwick, I have no complaints of how they're operating, but I do wish it was in the hands of a nonprofit, community-based organization, because innovation really takes place in that arena. We don't find a great deal of innovation that is generated, say, from government sponsored and operated kinds of projects. You know, they, they get stuck in, in, in a rut, in a sense, and, and they do what they did last year, they'll do next year. You know, you can anticipate. Where private, nonprofit groups who bring in a motley group of people who have an interest in doing some things in public access, they bring about some changes. So I, I really don't have a lot of complaint with what's going on, but I just have a desire to see that it goes back to a community-based organization at some point in time. Okay, take us back to the first convention at BBMC. Buffalo Black Media Coalition organized. Explain the work that went into putting that together. Oh, that was a tremendous. We did a lot of planning and a, a, a number of individuals came together to work on making that first conference a success. Uh, I can't call all of them the name at this point in time. It's been that long because I think that was in 1985 when we did that. But what we wanted to do we wanted to host a high quality conference to inform people as to what was happening in the field of communications. Not only just radio and television, but what was happening with uh, the telephone, how that was going to be generating some opportunity for people to go into business. We were looking at how African Americans could acquire business kinds of opportunities using the telecommunications 
process and the system and what was going on in the country. And I think we were very successful in doing that, not only here in Buffalo, but through the National Black Media Coalition by us publicizing what was happening. A lot of individuals took and took advantage of some opportunity. And we have now some people who went on and done very, very well within that business. Uh, I recall we were advocating at, at that time for black ownership of radio and television in this local area. And uh, it so happened when the FCC made some rulings that uh, prohibit newspapers and t t uh, ownership of more than one station or something like that within the area. We approached Cap Cities at that time and asked them to consider selling that station to an African American. And you know, fortunately, they took that up and they did go out and they sought out some African Americans with the potential to buy the station. And as a result of that, they formed a group that came together with under Queen City Broadcasting. Bruce Llewellyn was the chairman of that group at that time, and he's out of. He's out of Philadelphia. He owns a Pepsi pop distribution kind of thing. Very wealthy man and very bright person too. So they and national, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus is another one of the people got involved in that. And using the FCC and the kind of uh, rebates or, 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 or assistance that they could get out of the FCC, they were able to purchase that station for, I think it was something like, a little over fifty million dollars, and I have to say that they had that assistance because we had a station that was sold just a few months before that for a hundred and twenty million dollars, which was the number three station in town. So they they picked up a real nice, you know, adventure, uh, investment adventure by doing that. So that's one of the things that came as a consequence of the conference. Uh, we had some very talented and nationally known individuals who come and to participate in our conference. Uh, Carl Simpson is one name that comes to my mind, but we had some very high powered people who are very familiar with the whole field of communications come in and do some uh, workshops for us and did a lot of encouragement and as a result of some of that some of our local people here were able to and network with them and go on and get jobs within the field and uh, right now we were able to as a consequence of setting up a training program that took place at uh, Channel 7 and a number of individuals went through that program and gone on to larger markets the same occurred with uh, Channel 4 and Channel 2. Channel 29 at the time was in its infancy. It wasn't doing that much. It had a very small staff. It wasn't aggressive as it is today. It was Fox Communication. I don't think it was Fox at that time. It was something else. But uh, anyhow, the initiatives that was taken for, uh, coming out of the conference led to a lot of pretty people getting jobs. And many of them, some of them are working right now in the industry here locally as well as in other cities in larger markets throughout the country. And how would you evaluate the success of that convention? The success, I have people coming to me today uh, and you know saying, John, you need to do another conference. We need to have another conference like that in Buffalo because we only held, hosted two. But it was such, it was so well done that people remember it even today and recommend that we do something on that order again because they feel that there are issues that need to be brought to the public attention and to assist and support the people who are currently within the media as best as we could. Okay. What are your thoughts and impressions on the New Adelphia communications project that's going on or supposedly going on in the city of Buffalo today? I'm pleased to see that project take off and you know because Buffalo needs the kind of shot in the arm that the Adelphia new construction and the jobs is going to generate. We, we need that here, okay? Uh, early on when they came out with some workforce and 
subcontracting goals within the construction portion of that, I was disturbed by that because we comprise better than 35% of the city's population. And as a result, I don't think that we should be looking at 10% participation. I think that's way below what ought to be taking place. So I did write some letters to the mayor and I wrote the letters to the council people and I demanded that they increase the workforce and the job participation up to at least 25% which we had been doing or receiving in terms of another other, a number of other public works projects that was taking place in the city of Buffalo. Now, I know Adelphia is not a public works project, but they're getting over $123 million of federal, state, and governmental funds. So technically, it's a public works project. So we should begin, in our city, we should have at least a sizable, or greater than 10% participation on the job. Uh, thanks to Council President Pitt and hearings he held, that number was increased to 25%. We're in now, I can see that, you know, we're gonna have an opportunity to get some jobs for individuals, also some training kinds of things should be taking place as a consequence of that, because it's, it's a dire need for it in our community. Yeah, that'll be for African Americans as well? It will be for low income individuals, and you know, who has suffering most from low income other than blacks, you know, American Indians, Hispanics, you know, those are the ones that are suffering most in terms of, you know, finances and jobs and things of that nature. So this will be a boom to some extent. It won't solve the problem, but it will be some assistance towards leading to some resolution of unemployment and better paying jobs in our community. Okay. Are you still involved with media advocacy today? Yes, I am. It's not as strong, as not as active as I was uh, earlier on, you know, but time doesn't allow me to do it. And it's expensive because when I go in and I do a file review, they'll charge me for every piece of literature that I run copies off. And, you know, I don't have those kind of monies any longer to be able to front, you know, paying for all these stuff. And uh, Coalition is not dead, but it's not as active. It's, the membership is not as great as it was at that time. So there's no funds that way. And I, you know, and then where do you turn to to get money is to do certain kinds of things that might be involved with advocacy. You know, it, people are not that prone to, to release those dollars at this time. I think it could be done, but it would need somebody to go out and do a salesman kind of things to talk about what the coalition is doing for the community. And then maybe some folks would be willing to make donations to the organization. So lastly, what are, share some of your views on blacks in the media today in front of and behind the camera. Let me add, there's that thing they say about this one advertising, when you come a long way, baby. Well, that's the way I look at it in terms of what's happening within media. We have come a long way. When you look at what's happening on television today, you'll see a number of faces that look like us. You'll see Hispanics, you'll see Asians, you'll see a diversity of people. And the way they're dealing with the issues of the black community uh, is much better than it was at that point in time, okay, and some years ago. There's still some work to be done. There's a lot of work to get done. But, you know, I see changes and I think there's a sensitivity and, a, and an awareness and also some motivation to change some of the things that are taking place within the media today. We still need to have advocacy going on because we've got to shake them up a little bit in terms of pointing out to them that we are serious about having a fair representation within the communications industry. So, you know, there's work to be done. Uh, there are people coming along who are willing to do the work, but the question is, they got to begin to put the energy into the kind of activities that's going to bring about the change that we so dire need. Okay. That's it. Okay.